Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. This is part two in a set of videos where we're just exploring some interesting things about the history of lipids and uh, dispelling some misconceptions that lipids in the diet are actually really bad for you. Okay. Um, and so I really, in the previous video, went into a lot of the history of lipids, how we basically, as a society in the United States, pinned all sorts of diseases like obesity, type 2 diabetes mellitus, cardiovascular disease, coronary artery disease, you could go on and on. We pinned those on consumption of cholesterol and saturated fat. And then I went into um, just a very basic uh, schematic here of how cholesterol levels are regulated in the body. And there's multiple ways they're regulated, both through excretion of cholesterol metabolites like cholesterol sulfate, and then also the production of these oxysterols, which serve as a negative feedback mechanism on the cholesterol biosynthesis. And the bottom line here that I wanted to emphasize is that the cholesterol level that you have in your body at any given time is one of the most tightly regulated systems in human physiology, okay? Now that's not to say you can't dysregulate it, but what I wanted to really emphasize in the previous video was that cholesterol by itself, if you're just eating a lot of cholesterol, like let's say from a ribeye steak, or if you got the money or the opportunity, try a Wagyu steak, it is delicious. I had one once in my life, it's amazing. Very fatty steak, so it has a lot of cholesterol. But is that cholesterol by itself gonna cause me to have coronary artery disease? Is it gonna cause me to have a build of a plaque in my arteries? No. No, it is not. So, what does? And I left you with this in the previous video. We're going to pick up with it. And I gave you a hint. So, if we look at this food item right here, it looks probably delicious, but it's very, very bad for you. And the part of this that's really bad is the fact that it's loaded in sugar. So, before we go any further, I want to, I want to make something perfectly clear. I am in no way advocating for a zero sugar diet. Okay? That's, first of all, not practical. Um, for most people. It can be done. I actually tried it one time for three months. Um, I didn't have any issues with it other than the cost. Um, but I just decided to try it a few years ago. Um, you pretty much have to just eat a lot of meat and vegetables. Um, that's pretty much what you're doing if you're doing a zero sugar diet. So it's not practical. What I'm really advocating for here and what, this, what, the, what the literature would show is that you should have a zero or very low added sugar diet. So to have a zero absolute sugar diet is ridiculous because if you look at fruit, let's say, I don't think there's a single person on the planet that would argue that fruit is bad for you. Fruit has natural sugar, right? So if, you, if sugar's bad, does that mean I have to give up apples or bananas? No. What we're really concerned about is added sugar. So sugar that's not naturally found in a product or just if the product is totally processed and so they have to put a lot of sugar in it. So for example, Butterfinger, and this is an example right here, um, there's lots of different candies out there obviously, but candy bars are another great example of products that have a lot of added sugar. Um, soda products, so Coca-Cola is a great example of this. Now it doesn't have regular sucrose, it's high fructose corn syrup, but it's still added sugar. And then believe it or not, in a lot of fast food burgers, um, a lot of the pieces of them actually have a lot of added sugar. And so what we see in our society here in the United States, a lot of people, what we call the standard American diet, consume a lot of sugar. What we're going to do in this video is explore how exactly you get clogged arteries, so to speak, or what we call atherosclerosis. How do your arteries get damaged and that predisposes you to CVD and CAD, right? So what's the problem? It's sugar. Let's make that perfectly clear and define it. It is chronic sugar uptake or chronic sugar intake, however you want to put it. And again, we're not talking about any sugar. We're talking about added sugar. If you're eating fruits or vegetables that might have a little bit of sugar in them, some of them do, that's nothing to worry about, okay? Believe me. However, it's the added sugar. And if you do this chronically over time, you're going to lead to problems. Okay. So what happens when you have a chronic sugar intake where it's elevated way above what your body needs? Well, you have chronic insulin elevation. Remember that insulin is a hormone released by the beta cells of the pancreas, and insulin's always released in response to sugar. However, the way insulin is supposed to be released 
is it's supposed to be only when you have a meal. And it's not even supposed to go up that high. Okay? It's supposed to be released just when you have a meal, and then it goes back down. So there's a lot of problems with um, the way insulin's released in our society. First of all, as a society, we tend to just eat ridiculous amounts of sugar in one sitting. Okay? So that would spike insulin a lot more than um, would just a normal healthy meal. Okay? But the other problem is in our society, we like to graze. You know, we get, we get tired at work, so we go to the vending machine, get a candy bar or chips or something. So what happens is rather than eating meals, we tend to graze throughout the day. And so our insulin levels just remain elevated over a longer period of time, and they don't really ever go back down as well as they should. And so you end up with chronically elevated insulin levels. Now, this is a problem. Insulin is a hormone. It's not just to get glucose into cells. It does accomplish that. However, insulin has a host, a plethora of other biological effects. One of the things that insulin does is it elevates hepatic lipid synthesis enzymes. Okay? Um, that's just one thing that it does. So insulin can actually act on the liver, and it will change how the liver actually synthesizes and outputs lipids. Okay? So one thing that insulin does here is it elevates the output of VLDL from the liver. Okay. Now, this process is not super well understood as far as I know, but think of it this way. Okay. If you're having to output a lot of VLDL from the liver, you'd want it to occur in a reasonably slow fashion. Okay. Because notice, you actually have to build up the lipoprotein. Okay. Now, what I'm about to say is a, is a criminally oversimplified version of this, of what actually happens. And to be honest, I'm not really sure that it's super well understood. But think of it this way. If you're elevating your VLDL output, okay, think of the liver as needing adequate time to make the VLDL. Okay? So if you provide it adequate time, meaning your insulin levels are not super elevated, it has time to kind of build up the lipoprotein and make it sufficiently large. However, if you're having to increase the output so much that you have to, in, you have to output VLDLs more quickly, the liver doesn't really have time to build it up, and so it's going to end up being smaller. Okay. Now, these are LDLs, not VLDLs, but remember that VLDLs are eventually processed down to LDLs. So if you have an elevated VLDL output, that's going to cause smaller VLDLs, and then you're going to have smaller, denser LDLs. Okay. So there's actually two kinds of LDLs. There's a normal, uh, a less dense LDL. They're low density, right? They ought to be low density. But then there's this other kind that tends to be produced more when you have a chronic sugar intake and chronic insulin elevation. This is a small, dense LDL. Okay? Now, let's hold there for a second. There's another system at play here. Reactive oxidative species, which are free radicals, they are bad in high amounts. You need some of them, but when they're elevated, it's very bad. Chronic sugar intake causes inflammation. I really should have just put inflammation somewhere in this line right here. But chronic sugar intake increases inflammation, which triggers the production of more free radicals. So here's the deal. If you combine elevated free radicals with small, dense LDL, you've got a recipe for what's called oxidized LDL. This is one kind of what we call uh, modified LDL, and sometimes it's abbreviated LDL-OX for oxidized. This stuff is very bad. In fact, I really ought to color this red because it's very bad. You don't want oxidized LDL. Now, why is the shape and size of the LDL so important? Well, if we have a normal, large, less dense LDL, so it's just normal, okay, these tend to be resistant to oxidation by free radicals. Okay? They're not nowhere near, nearly as easily oxidized by free radicals, even if they were elevated. Okay? The other thing is, is they can't fit through endothelial cell gaps. Okay? So, for example, we have right out here, um, I should mention that this is the blood area. Okay? So this right here, this is actually the lumen of a blood vessel. Okay? So I should you know, type that. This is our lumen of the blood vessel, just so you have some, let me spell that right, just so you have some uh, orientation here. Okay, so this is the lumen. Here's the endothelial cells. Okay, so remember that some particles, especially if they're small, can actually fit through the gaps in endothelial cells. Remember, there's gaps between endothelial cells that line the blood vessel. And if you were to cross this, you'd end up in the extracellular matrix, and there's, of course, smooth muscle over here. There's your layers of blood vessel, that's some anatomy. Okay, 
So generally speaking, only smaller particles can actually go through these endothelial cell slits. Okay? Large LDL can't fit. Okay? So large LDL, they would tend to stay in the blood. Okay? However, chronic insulin elevation leads to the production of smaller, dense LDLs. This is a problem for two reasons. One, free radicals are very small. They're just little molecules. They can easily fit through endothelial cell junctions. Okay? So you can end up with reactive oxidative species in here. But the small, dense LDLs are small enough, they can fit through and squeeze through those endothelial cell gaps or junctions. So if you combine a small, dense LDL with reactive oxidative species, you can build up oxidized LDL in the extracellular matrix of the blood vessel. That's again because LDLs that are small and dense have increased susceptibility to free radical oxidation, and they easily fit through endothelial cell gaps or junctions, whatever you want to call them. And so in the extracellular matrix, I can end up with oxidized LDL. This all occurs when you have chronically elevated sugar intake and chronically elevated insulin levels. That is a big problem. So here's just a, just a very uh, broad brush strokes, what we're talking about, just a quick recap. All these sugary foods, really with sugar, especially the candy and the soda, they lead to chronically high levels of insulin being released from the pancreas. And that insulin, of course, is going to act on the liver. You're going to increase the triglyceride synthesis because that's what insulin does. You're going to increase VLDL output. You're going to have inflammation. You're going to have oxidative stress. You're going to see all of these things elevated. For example, C-reactive protein is a trigger of inflammation. You're going to have fibrinogen elevated. That leads to blood clotting. You're going to have VLDL and LDL that are way too high in triglycerides. So you're going to have a lot of issues here. And then also your HDL is going to go down. And all of these things are going to predispose a person to type 2 diabetes mellitus and atherosclerosis, both of which contribute to coronary artery disease. And I also put the link down here, or I should say really the citation here where I got this information. So I'm going to conclude this video right here, and I'll mention that we're going to pick up with this in the next video and actually talk about how this actually leads to atherosclerosis. Okay? Um, it's actually a kind of an interesting process, and there's a lot of misconceptions about it um, that we're going to clear up here. But hopefully in this video, I've made a case for you that dietary cholesterol by itself is not going to do anything with clogging your arteries, and that's because cholesterol synthesis itself is so tightly regulated. In one video we talked about um, cholesterol returning to the liver and how it's regulated that way. We also talked about just generally cholesterol synthesis regulation, but what does it is the sugar. And unfortunately, um, up until late, the United States, if you went into any grocery store, you would really just see low-fat products. It's only been in the past few years that we've really seen a lot of low-sugar products. Um, and I'm just curious to know what you guys have seen, for those of you who are viewing from other countries. Um, how has your uh, country actually handled this? Have you seen a lot of low-fat products, or is your country predominantly low sugar? And how has it been in the past few years? Please comment. Um, I'm curious to know that. But hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of how we actually get these LDLs into the extracellular matrix. They're not normal LDLs. It's kind of the offspring of having chronic insulin elevation due to high sugar intake, right? And in the next video, we're going to discuss the mechanisms of atherosclerosis. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you very much.